Once around, Tabby Star. Truly shocking and fascinating discovery when it was first announced. Tabby Star is just off the base of Cygnus, near to the star Deneb there at the, the uh, tail of the constellation of Cygnus the Swan. But it's a very faint star. It's too faint, really, to go tracking down. Magnitude 11.7 is right on the limit for many amateur telescopes. And actually, all you'll see is a faintest of dots. But go ahead if you want to have a go. Now, we believe it's uh, 1,470 light years away from us. That's quite a significant distance and accounts partly for why it's so faint. It was noted to be of such great interest as a result of the Kepler Space Telescope mission. Kepler Telescope was sent up into orbit to stare at a patch of sky in that region and to look for the transits of planets passing in front of their parent star, causing a dip in the light curve um, illustrated at the top there. And the data was presented as part of the Planet Hunters program, where you could join as a citizen scientist and you would be given lots of training data and then given data sets where you would look to see if you could see in amongst all the noise and variability of chosen stars, whether or not the light curve was taking a dip and revealing the presence of a planet. And I indeed did a lot of that and uh, found a number of hits as a result. But the uh, Kepler input catalogue number 8462852 is Boyan star. And this was also coded as LGM2, as a homage to LGM1, the discovery of pulsars by Jocelyn Bell Burnell here in Cambridge. So let's take a look at what I will call Tabby's star from now on, named after Tabitha, who was the person who promulgated the discovery. It's an F-type main sequence star, so nothing very unorthodox, uh, just a little bit hotter than our sun. And it's a double star. It has a red dwarf companion orbiting round it about 900 astronomical units away. An AU, the Earth-Sun distance. 30 AU would be the distance to Neptune. So this is quite a long way away, 30 times the distance of Neptune. And what was particularly unusual about it was the light curve. The light curve, of course, was what we were all looking at trying to find planets. And you would see the light curve take a dip of a few percent. The one that I found had a 3% dip, revealing the presence of a planet nearly as large as Saturn, orbiting another different F-type star. And in this case, the, there were some dips larger than that, but the behavior overall was thoroughly weird. It had a very irregular pattern to it, just didn't seem to repeat. Some of the uh, dips were longer than others, some were very narrow. So something strange was going on here. Something might be blocking the light, now, if it was a planet, it would look much more like this. This is an extract from the Planet Hunter's data. And the idea is your planet passes in front of the star. And when it does so, you get a dip. And you will get one every time of more or less the same intensity as the planet goes in front of the star. Now, it may vary a little bit depending on exactly the path that the planet takes because you get this phenomenon called limb darkening around the edge of the star, as shown in the illustration there. It's less bright than it is in the centre. So if you have your planet pass directly across the central point of the star, you'll block part of the bright disk, where if it's only grazes and only passes the limb, that you'll get a less uh, intense drop in the light. But they should be pretty regularly spaced, as the planet orbits around. Obviously, there are reasons why the planet's orbit might be perturbed, but they should all also be pretty narrow. Um, planets are generally small. So 
something very strange going on with those weird light drops at Tabby's star. Well, if it wasn't a planet, what could it have been? Well, we also saw a lot of traces illustrated schematically here from eclipsing binaries, a companion star that you couldn't see, but was orbiting around closely with its uh, companion and passing the line of sight so that you would have alternating star A blocking the light from star B and then half an orbit later star B blotting out part of the light from star A. And it's fairly natural that the two stars are not equal in brightness. So you would get this strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak, alternating period of um, or alternating depth of the half orbital period um, of the uh, dips in the light curve. So I saw a lot of those in Planet Hunters and labeled them all up as um, eclipsing binaries. Well, if it's not a planet and it's not a companion star, how about a dust disk going around? Well, that's possible, but it just didn't seem necessarily quite to make sense why a disk of dust would have such irregular um, and uh, strange behavior. So it remains a possibility, but we're not entirely sure on that one. It would have to be very lumpy. Well, if it's not a dust disk, how about a swarm of comets then? That could work. If you had a whole swarm of comets swirling around the star, maybe the comets and their tails would create transit events. Uh, but some of them would have to be pretty big because these transits were blotting out light more significant even than um, my planet KIC 9147029b, if you're interested, which was this Saturn-sized planet around an F type star that created only a 0.3 percent dip some of these dips were bigger so these would have to be really quite significantly large and opaque things another suggestion was a dust cloud from a giant impact maybe there had been a very large cosmic train wreck of uh, one baby planet smashing into another one around uh, tabby's star and creating a huge and irregular cloud of uh, dust and gas. And that could be just the right sort of thing. But the suggestions just keep coming. How about a planet with rings, such that the main planet and the body of the rings could intersect the line of sight and blot out the light starlight? And depending on exactly the orientation of the rings and whether the whole of the ring system was involved in the transit or not, you would get all sorts of uh, different behavior from those light curves. So, yeah, that might work. Um, a large planet with a whole load of asteroids following it. It would have to be a lot of asteroids. They would have to be able to blot out um, something significantly similar to the size of the whole planet, but rather like the comet hypothesis, you can't rule this one out. And then we had the really interesting suggestions. Maybe this was the work of an alien civilization building a large artificial ring around the star. Maybe they'd uh, undertaken an immense engineering project and created a large ring. And what we were seeing was the shadow of the ring coming our way as this ring crossed our line of sight, given that we didn't really know the orientation of the equator of the star or how it rotated. This is entirely sort of plausible, I suppose. Um, perhaps they'd even gone further and the aliens had built or part built a complete Dyson sphere encapsulating their star and they might be trying to completely capture the energy of the radiation of the star for their nefarious purposes. Um, entirely possible as a 
theoretical idea. I think uh, it's extremely uh, difficult to see how you would go about doing this because the amount of material that you would need to create such a mega structure would re require you to, you know, take several Earth masses um, and completely refine the whole lot into your materials. It's just uh, extreme indeed. But not impossible, I suppose. Well, maybe there are aliens there. So the SETI people turned their artificial radio source detectors to it. Uh, in 2015, they found nothing. In 2016, people had a look for optical transients in case there were um, strong beamed light sources from the aliens, and they didn't find any. And a year later, they tried with lasers, trying to detect any laser emissions that might come our way and didn't find any. But I just have to say that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So the fact that we can't find these things doesn't necessarily mean that they're not there. But 2018, Tabby reported that the observations of her star showed dimming that was different depending on which wavelength of light you looked at. So follow-up observations with a spectrometer were able to show that the light from the star was being uh, reduced differently at different wavelengths. So this does not suggest a truly solid object. Um, I suppose it might mean the Dyson sphere's got windows in it that are tinted, um, or, you know, there's all sorts of explanations that you could go back to. But it's most likely down to space dust, um, and there's the dust blocking some wavelengths more strongly than others. So a fascinating episode how a, a, a comparatively simple observation can lead to all these different possible explanations, including the fact that it might just be an alien megastructure. And so with that thought, I'll leave you there. Thanks very much.